delve into our, our excellent panel here and learn a little bit more about what the actual status of the negotiations are and the impact it might have um, within Iran and the region. So um, I'll just introduce our panel. So um, to my immediate left is Ali Reza Nader. He's a senior international policy analyst at the RAND Corporation. His research has focused on Iran's political dynamics, elite decision making, and Iranian foreign policy. And prior to joining RAND, Nader, uh, Ali Reza Nader served as a research analyst at the Center for Naval Analyses. Um, to his left is uh, Suzanne Maloney. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution, where her research focuses on energy, economic reform, and US policy towards the Middle East. Uh, most recently, she was a member of the State Department's policy planning staff covering Iran, Iraq, the Gulf states, and broader Middle East issues. And at the far end there is Alex Fatanka. He's a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington. He specializes in Middle Eastern regional security affairs with a particular focus on Iran. Uh, from 2006 through 2010, he was the managing editor of Jane's Islamic Affairs Analyst. Alex is also a senior fellow in Middle East Studies at the US Air Force Special Operations School. So I'd like to thank them all for joining us. And I think I'll open up with um, a question to Suzanne. Um, if you could just kind of lay the backdrop for us and get us up to date on the status of the negotiations. Um, there are a few kind of major sticking points that remain, particularly on this issue of Iran's past um, possible nuclear weapons work. Um, how big of an obstacle do you see that? And, um, and what other kind of disagreements do you foresee, especially um, on the pace of sanctions relief, which also seems to be an issue? Thanks so much, Yegane, and thanks so much to Murad for organizing this discussion. Um, uh, as we approach the deadline, the latest deadline, I'm sure you all have a little bit of deadline fatigue if you've been following this issue. We've been in negotiations with Iran, or the world has been in negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program for more than a dozen years. The latest phase uh, has really was kicked off after the 2013 election of Hassan Rouhani. And as you know, there was a joint uh, agreement signed, an interim agreement signed in November 2013. And we've been working ever since then to try to get past the finish line. And each of the prior deadlines has experienced an extension when it was quite clear that the two sides couldn't come to an agreement. I think the odds are better this time around that we actually will make it across that finish line. Um, but obviously, uh, you can never say never with respect to Iran, and particularly not with respect to these negotiations. Uh, the announcement in early April of a political framework for the deal was a really important uh, stepping stone to getting a final agreement. It really was the first time that the, the sides had nailed down the major technical issues, come to an agreement that they were b both comfortable with uh, putting forward in a public fashion. Uh, and that really, I think, is where we still are. There, there, that the sides left, and there have been constant negotiations ever since then. Um, but there's an enormous amount of detail that has to be worked out. And as Yegan I said, there are still some fairly substantial differences between the Iranians and the group that we know to be the P5 plus one, the permanent five members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. One of those issues is the question of prior military dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program. Um, possible military dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program, often referred to as PMD. Uh, and Secretary Kerry was quoted on this uh, earlier in the week in a way that set off a bit of a firestorm that perhaps the administration was walking back its position. Um, as I understand it, PMD in satisfying the concerns about Iran's prior weaponization work still ranks very high on the list for the administration and for the rest of the coalition in terms of a final agreement. It's considered, you know, sort of one of the fundamental requirements of a deal that, in fact, this, uh, these outstanding concerns are satisfied. I think the tone of Secretary Kerry's remarks um, may have uh, given away the fact that ultimately the United States doesn't need the International Atomic Energy Agency to tell us what we already know, which is that there are legitimate concerns about what Iran was doing over the course of its long and for much of uh, the history covert nuclear program. Um, and so in fact, um, we're not so much looking for the certification of information that we can already uh, confirm through our own sources. But what we're looking for is a very clear uh, process through which when the international community requests access to Iranian facilities, 
uh, through the International Atomic Energy Agency, that in fact those requests and that access is upheld. So that principle in and of itself is very important. The satisfaction of these concerns, because that's really what led us to this process of negotiations, can't simply be wished away, even if I think it, we all believe or we all acknowledge that the report that comes out of this process is not likely to be as robust, as damning, as, as fully complete as we would like it to be. The Iranians aren't going to come to the table and say, aha, here we go. In fact, we were working toward a weapon. It's going to be a contested report. Um, but ultimately, that report must be done. And that is one of, I think, one of the major asks of the negotiations. And I don't think we'll get a deal unless that is included in it. The other issue that you're going to mention, sanctions relief, um, I think was one of the areas that was left most vague in the Lausanne announcement of early April, um, deliberately so. For much of the past 18 months or so of negotiations, the focus in the press, and I think to some extent the focus behind the scenes, has really been on this debate about what do we do about um, Iran's breakout timeline, about its centrifuge capacity, or these technical issues of the, of the nuclear program itself. There were always talks, and there was always a, a fairly large delegation working on the issue of sanctions relief. But to some extent, it was back burner until you got the technical piece effectively resolved. Um, and, and I think what we now see is that the sanctions picture is one that is incredibly complicated. Um, one in which I would argue the Iranians don't have the same level of capacity in terms of the understanding of the U.S. and international sanctions regime that the P5 plus 1 can bring to the table. We devise these sanctions. We implement them every day. We know how they work, um, and we know exactly how the Iranians have tried to get around them. And so, in effect, you know, we have a bit of an advantage here. Um, you know, I think what we're likely to see in terms of sanctions relief is not what the Iranians have come out publicly insisting must be the case, which is that we will have uh, all nuclear-related sanctions disappear, uh, disappear from the page of time um, on the day that an agreement is signed. That's simply not possible. Um, there simply isn't the trust on the two sides. You need a kind of verification process. And so as I understand the, the, the process that's underway, and I think both Alex and Ali will have uh, uh, something to say on all this as well, um, there, you know, there will be a number of requirements for the Iranians to satisfy, including satisfying PMD concerns, including the reconfiguration of the Iraq plutonium reactor, including uh, reduction of the numbers of centrifuges by a fairly substantial amount. We've heard about talk. The numbers that were put out in Lausanne were looking at somewhere in the realm of 14,000 centrifuges being mothballed. Um, and then also, of course, dealing with the issue of the stockpile of low enriched uranium, which the Iranians have. And that's an issue not just for the final agreement, but for the implementation of the interim agreement as well, how they do that, how quickly they can do that. None of this can be done overnight. Um, I'm not a technical person, but when I talk to the technical people, they tell me it will take a period of at least months um, and so the expectation is if we were to get a deal sometime in late June, early July, we'd be looking at a four to six month period of, of the Iranians actually fulfilling those obligations. And on the day such obligations are certified, on the day that the International Atomic Energy Agency has set, can, can say that in fact all these big obligations have been met on the side of the Iranians, you could see same day action from a number of different relevant bodies, the EU, the United Nations, the Obama administration, all taking action thanks to the magic of uh, our round globe and time change, you could have a certain immediacy to that. But the idea that we're going to have sanctions relief in early July um, is, is one that is simply not viable. The Iranian negotiators and presumably decision makers understand this and have understood it from the start. Why they are selling the deal in a slightly shorter time frame to their own people, to me, remains an open question. And maybe that uh, others have ideas. Um, is it possible that they're trying to put pressure on um, the Western negotiators? And do you think that would work? I think sanctions relief is a much better r rationale for walking away from a deal or for, for, for a failure to get a deal than, uh, than holding out on centrifuge numbers if you're, if you're sitting in the, the shoes of the Iranian negotiators. They go back to their people and say, the United States simply won't give up these measures. Their Congress um, and the Republicans, whomever it might be, the bad guys are not going to let them do this. And so therefore, um, you know, we just can't take a deal in which we get nothing for it. 
That's never been the case, and it's always been understood that the nuclear-related sanctions were a tool, a means to an end, and if we can get the end, we will dispense with the tool, at least uh, on a conditional basis. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that part of this is uh, a game of narratives on both sides. And, you know, I think you've also seen the Obama administration have to get a little bit more specific about certain kinds of rhetoric, whether it's the, the SNAP inspections, um, which will not quite be any time, any place, or 24-7. Everyone has to be a little bit more specific with their rhetoric. Um, and both uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, and, and President Rouhani have an incentive to, to tell their own people that the sanctions relief is only a week or a month away because in effect for I think for Iranians and Ali and, and Alex will have more to say on this you know the election itself was was the big move and then the interim deal they you know they sort of are, have been waiting for a peace dividend for for at least 18 months and probably two years now because they feel they've done their part they elected the guy to get the deal um, and so they're waiting to see the economic benefits to the country as a result of it. And, and obviously, their leaders have to, have to convince them to wait just a little bit longer. Um, so luckily for us, we do have an expert on Iran's internal dynamics as well. So I'd like to turn to Ali. Um, one thing I was struck by in the results, in the, in the poll results, um, is uh, the number of Iranian Americans who um, view it as uh, being able to bring about um, an improvement in personal and civil liberties um, inside Iran. 66% of respondents said that this deal could bring about um, greater civil, civil liberties. At the same time that these negotiations are going on, there's the um, trial right now in the hardline revolutionary court of um, Jason Razayan, who's the Washington Post correspondent in Tehran. Um, how do you think this deal would affect the internal balance inside Iran uh, between the moderates um, or reformists um, who are kind of represented by President Rouhani and uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, and then the more hardline elements who still control the judiciary, the parliament, other, other elements of Iran's um, uh, politics? I, I think that's a million dollar question because it looks like a deal is more likely than not at this point. And so I think the next question is what Iran is going to look like after a deal. And some have argued that the good thing about having a deal like this is that it buys the United States more time and hopefully the Iranian political system will evolve in the next 10, 15 years and become more moderate and pursue uh, po policies that are more amenable to American interests. And I, when I think about uh, Rouhani's presidency, I really, what st really sticks out for me is before he became president, when he was campaigning in Iran, and uh, back then, he wasn't relatively well known. He was part of the system, he'd had senior positions, but he was never a politician in Iran. Uh, nevertheless, his campaign events attracted tons of people, young Iranians who were very excited that he was running and really liked his message that he wanted to resolve the nuclear issue and improve the economy and uh, desecuritize Iran's political and social atmosphere. And that was the, you know, the term he used, desecuritize, because he felt that under the Ahmadinejad presidency, repression had really increased in Iran. And so I think that's what the public in Iran is waiting for when it comes to the deal, that not only will the economy improve, but that people will have more personal freedoms. You know, the kind of free freedoms they experienced under President Khatami, um, which was a relatively more open time in Iran's post-revolutionary period. And I have no doubt that once there's a deal, Rouhani is going to become much more popular, and his foreign minister is going to become uh, much more popular. The question is how Rouhani can translate that into changes within Iran. Uh, you know, the number one issue will be the economy. It will take some time for the economy to improve in Iran. And even if uh, Iran's funds are uh, released, because Iran has 50 to $100 billion of frozen um, funds in foreign bank accounts, if those funds are released and there are sanctions relief, it will take a few years for the economy to, to improve, but we won't necessarily see a trickle-down effect either. I mean, the Iranian government is going to take a big cut from the windfall uh, 
from the money being released and any economic benefits. Uh, Iran has a largely state-controlled economy, so the private sector might not benefit in the short term anyways. All of this is Rouhani's uh, goal. So economically, there will be some improvements, but I question whether the improvements will happen in a short amount of time and whether they'll be that significant. Because even uh, when Ahmadinejad was president and Iran didn't face sanctions and oil prices were at a record high, Iran, I think under Ahmadinejad's presidency, earned $700 billion in oil proceeds. $700 billion is a lot um, for a middle-income country. Uh, even then, there was a lot of economic pressure on the average Iranian. Inflation was high. There was a uh, high unemployment. So I think Rouhani has his, uh, is going to face many obstacles in improving the economy, even with a nuclear deal, even if sanctions relief happen within the next few months. Now, politically, I think he'll face the greatest challenge because so far, the establishment in Iran the leader, the revolutionary guards, the conservative clerics have supported nuclear negotiations. And there have been a few dissenting voices, but largely Rouhani has a support of the system because the sanctions are bad for business. And in order for the regime to survive and thrive, uh, it needs for the nuclear program to be resolved. And so, Rouhani has enough backing from within the system to proceed with nuclear negotiations and come up with a final deal. But there's really no indication that the establishment has agreed to major changes in Iran. And I think the opposite is actually true. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader, and his supporters have consistently said that they don't want the reformists to come back to power in Iran. Uh, they're still very suspicious of the Green Movement of 2009. Uh, they see the United States as being opposed to the Islamic Republic. Uh, they're afraid that the West is challenging the regime's values. Uh, so the political structure hasn't changed. The personalities haven't changed. Uh, it's just that the government in Iran really wants a nuclear deal. And uh, I'm not sure beyond the immediate economic benefits they see any benefit to the deal. And if we look at the trend lines, uh, they haven't been good in terms of political and social reforms. There's the imprisonment of Jason Rezaian. The human rights situation in Iran is as bad as ever, if in some ways not worse, uh, even under Rouhani. Uh, there is still lack of press freedom, social media is severely restricted. Uh, Iranians who live abroad have been told they're welcome to come home and they've been arrested. Uh, so the trends are not good. And some might argue that the nuclear deal will make Rouhani so popular that the conservatives will have little choice but to let them enact changes in Iran. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know, I, I, as an analyst, I like to see how Rouhani can translate his popularity into real political change. So, you know, one avenue is the parliamentary, upcoming parliamentary elections. Will his allies be allowed to win? Or is the Guardian Council, which uh, vets candidates in Iran, are they going to basically disallow uh, candidates that are more moderate or even somewhat reformist. So I think I mean, that's one indicator there. And even if Rouhani and his allies win parliament, the, the parliament in Iran doesn't have great powers. Uh, there are still a lot of unelected institutions that control the country uh, and are going, really are not going to allow any changes. And we've seen this in the past, for example, when Khatami was president, uh, the security establishment countered his reforms by assassinating art artists and scholars and dissidents. Um, so I'm skeptical that we're going to see great changes in Iran just because of a nuclear deal. Now you can make the argument in the long term, uh, Iran has ingredients for change. It has a well-educated population uh, that supports change in Iran. It has a good economic base and a good technological base. 
if Iran opens up more, you can make the argument that you know, once sanctions are eased, that foreign companies are going to go into Iran, that will help the more secular, anti-Islamist, middle and upper classes, that the private sector will grow. I think that's an open question. There's potential uh, for that to happen, uh, but it's, it's going to take a lot more than just a nuclear deal. And I think, essentially, other changes ha have to happen in Iran. Once uh, Khamenei passes away, we'll have to see who or what kind of uh, institution succeeds them, who grabs power in Iran, and that is very hard to tell at this point. Uh, I mean, Khamenei is still alive, and the system he has uh, really protected for the past, what, 36 years uh, pretty much stands strong. Um, and I think Rouhani has bought the regime some time. He has pre eased pressure on the regime. Uh, but essentially, I don't see him as a man who really wants to push things too far at this point. I mean, his agenda is resolving the nuclear issue, improving the economy, pushing back the revolutionary guards from the economy a little bit. And I think for him, that might be good enough. Um, can I get you to address the opposite scenario? Um, Suzanne laid out some of the obstacles uh, to a deal. What happens inside Iran if, for one reason or another, or many, many, many possible reasons, the deal doesn't happen, um, and we have to we continue negotiations, or everyone goes back to their their capitals? What what happens inside Iran then? And Suzanne addressed this, and I think the key is the narrative. I mean, both both sides, the United States and Iran are engaged in this competition in terms of who defines uh, failure. So if Iran walks away from the talks, uh, will Iran be able to portray the United States as being at fault? And I think one of the reasons it was essential for Congress to hold off on sanctions while the negotiations were ongoing is because if Congress had complicated the talks, and that was the international perception that the rest of the P5 plus one and also the public in Iran thought the United States was at fault, it would have made negotiating with Iran more difficult. At this point, you know, the Rouhani government is going to have a very hard time if it comes across as being intransigent, um, because I think a good deal has been offered to it, a deal which really hinders Iran's nuclear program for sanctions relief. And I think, you know, some of the haggling is, is just the two sides trying to get the best deal possible. You know, I mean, the Iranian government says they want sanctions relief immediately. Uh, they very well know that's not possible, but they like to get it sooner than later, right? Uh, although they've been negotiating for two years. Uh, so I think uh, both sides realize that if the talks fail, uh, they have to blame the other, and the international community has to believe that. And then the Iranian government has to answer its own people, uh, you know, why there isn't a nuclear deal, why is it important for Iran to have a specific number of centrifuges and be able to enrich uranium, um, you know, why is the average Iranian under immense economic pressure two years after Rouhani uh, was elected. And it's not like the Iranian people can impeach Rouhani or Khamenei. And I would even be, even be surprised if uh, Rouhani doesn't win a second term, even if the negotiations fail, because that's what always happens in Iran. The president always wins a second term. Uh, but nevertheless, I think there's potential for unrest and ins insurgency. And we saw that uh, before Rouhani became president. I mean, the country was really boiling up. In 2009, it was chaotic. And um, Iranians were still uh, very anxious and frustrated about their situation. So I think ultimately the Iranian government has to uh, really justify why it has not been able to come to a deal. All right, Alex, if I can turn to you um, to address some of the regional dynamics. And this is a question that the PIA poll also addressed. Um, and one of the findings was that 80% um, of respondents um, believe that the deal will improve Iran's relations with its neighbors. Um, 
or sorry, with relations with the West, while 60% believe it will improve Iran's relations with its neighbors. Um, when it comes to Iran's regional behavior, um, I think some of the conflict points are its activities in Syria, its activities in Iraq, um, its support for groups in Yemen. Um, can you give us your view on how would a nuclear deal, if at all, affect um, Iran's uh, activities in the region? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, pretty much uh, to follow up on what Ali and, and Suzanne said, uh, and if I could answer, Yegan, your question in this context. Um, if you want to understand what Rouhani might or not, might not do in the region, we have to go back to the relationship that he effectively has with the Supreme Leader. I mean, there's one relationship here in the context of the Islamic Republic that obviously matters more than anything else, and that's the relationship the President has with the Supreme Leader. If you bear in mind that there are three centers of power in Iran, the Supreme Leader, the Presidency, and the Revolution Guards, what you've had, had in place for the last almost two years is a consensus between the Supreme Leader and the President that says we need to restructure uh, at home and we need to look for ways to turn a page with the outside world. Now, we can debate why this consensus came about because certainly it didn't exist when Ahmadinejad was around, but the fact is that Rouhani came up and said to the Supreme Leader, things have to change, otherwise the entire uh, survival of this Islamic system that came to being in 1979 is at stake. And as of today, the Supreme Leader of Iran is backing that key message that Rouhani put on the table. As of today, the Supreme Leader has not been opposed on, on, um, on the key issue uh, that we've heard, uh, the nuclear uh, issue. But that's, that's the critical point here. So the Supreme Leader did not give Hassan Rouhani a carte blanche, uh, or, you know, a, black, a blank, blank check to go out there and pursue whatever he wanted in the region or domestically. It's a very narrow focus, which is get these sanctions lifted. And with Hassan Rouhani, the clever politician who's been around since before the revolution actually succeeded, has done is very much to focus on that issue. So as you heard from Ali earlier, he hasn't done anything domestically in terms of letting radical reformers come in to the fray. And I suspect he's going to have a very tough, uh, tough um, uphill battle in front of him as Iran prepares for the February 2016 elections. So what Rouhani has done very cleverly is to focus on the nuclear issue. And so far, Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, understands it at a necessity. The Iranian Supreme Leader didn't wake up one morning saying, hey, you know what, I've changed my mind about America. I suddenly actually want to have relations with America. That's not the point. The point is they're losing about, well, seven, eight billion dollars in oil revenue, about Half of Iran's oil revenue disappeared overnight from summer 2012. So the Supreme Leader comes to this very pragmatically. But again, to answer Yegana's point about the region, Supreme Leader did not turn around and say to Khamenei, go out there and see what you can do with the Saudis or whoever else. That's not uh, what the Supreme Leader has given Rouhani. And in fact, if you want to turn around and look at the system and see who might have that mandate in the Iranian system to, to sort of have the the say, uh, the biggest say in Iran's regional policy, it's not the foreign ministry, it's the Revolution Guards people. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And that comes down to one simple uh, point, which is the threat that the Iranians are facing today in the Middle East in the shape of the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq are not things, challenges that the foreign minister is going to be able to, to fix, right? You haven't had Iranian diplomats come back in body bags recently. You've had Revolution Guards gen generals and officers come back. Those are the guys at the forefront of the fight against the regional challenge that Iran is most upset about, concerned about, which is the Islamic State. So you see a clear delineation here, a division of labor. Hassan Rouhani has a political mandate from the top, from the Supreme Leader, and he has the entire foreign ministry, obviously, at his disposal to go out there and have these sanctions removed. But on the regional level, the Supreme Leader pretty much has made it clear that that's the job for the Revolutionary Guards with all the associated branches, obviously uh, primarily Quds Force. We all know the name Qasem Soleimani. He's the guy who is basically running much of that show with his other uh, you know, top commanders, people like Mohammed uh, Jaffrey and so on. So when I look at, and I want to pretty much agree with what we've heard so far, I think the Supreme Leader is focused on removing the sanctions for the sake of making sure this regime doesn't start imploding from within. 
Khamenei has paid attention to what happened in the Arab world since 2011. He knows full well that sort of instability could one day find itself in Iran too. Happen only in 2009, it could happen again. So he wants to remove the sanctions so they can start distributing some of that oil money back into the society to keep people somewhat satisfied. And that's not going to be an easy job, but sooner they get to having those sanctions removed, quicker they can get to tackling that issue. So the region for them right now, for, for, for the supreme leader, for the supreme leader, the region obviously is mostly one of challenges that at the moment, um, uh, we can't say Iran has won, we can't say they have lost. Um, but they're certainly engaged both in Syria and Iraq. And again, foreign ministry folks, people like Javad Zarif, aren't going to be the right people for those kinds of uh, fights. Now, let me just, if I could also say a few words about what if there is no deal. Um, if you look inside the Islamic Republic, you have the Rouhani faction and people associated with that who for a very long time, before the nuclear issue became the issue it is today, for a very long time, going back to the early 1990s, been making the case for having to improve relations with the United States. So these guys have been thinking about this for over two decades. Um, the Revolution Guards people, that third center in Iran, feels that any kind of big scale rapprochement with the United States will ch change Iran's character to the extent that they will be the losers at the end of that process. So from their perspective, they're fearful. What they're putting on the table as an alternative to Rouhani's rapprochement with the United States is the so-called, it's almost the same as what Mahmoud Ahmadinejad tried to pull off when he was around from 2005, which is the idea of look east. So, Revolution Guards people, I'm speculating, but I bet you they're sitting there waiting. If there is no deal, if this thing, whole uh, house of cards, whatever you want to call it, collapses, and I'm not saying it's house of cards. I agree. I think there's more of a chance of a success. But let's say it goes nowhere. Then these are the people that are arguing, look to Moscow, look to China, look to things like Shanghai Cooperation Organization, look for an alternative to the West. And that's the deeper schism that you have within the Islamic Republic. And it shows itself on the big sort of international relations, but it also shows itself uh, on regional matters. Uh, final point on regional uh, uh, issues. What we've seen... Um, when Rouhani was running around uh, trying to get himself elected in the summer of 2013, he specifically mentioned one country, as far as regional countries were concerned, that was Saudi Arabia. So he did come in with some sort of an intention to reach out to Saudi Arabia, because if you look at what Iran does in the region, there is no other damaging rivalry in that neighborhood uh, that is greater, uh, of, of greater concern to, to countries there than the one that Iran and Saudi Arabia have going on, which is a very much a zero-sum game. So he came in in 2013 and said, we're going to fix it. We're going to try and fix it. He appointed ambassador the Saudis liked, and for a while it looked like things were going to work out. But then you had... Islamic State increasingly uh, becoming a factor, first obviously in Syria, and then Mosul fell exactly last year, um, which made it harder for Rouhani domestically to stand there and re be seen to be reaching out to the Saudis, bearing in mind that the Iranian perspective is that Saudi Arabia is behind the Islamic State. Now, that's a whole different uh, issue, but I'm saying that's the Iranian uh, Islamic Republic's perspective in terms of where, the, uh, where Islamic State is coming from. So with that, with the rise of the Islamic State and then March of this year with the Saudi intervention in Yemen, the idea of reaching out to Saudi Arabia has become so much harder. They're not going to walk away from uh, wanting to talk to the Saudis, but the fact is it's so much harder today than it was when uh, Rouhani got himself elected. So to the poll, I think that's an optimistic number. Um, but uh, that said, if there is a nuclear deal, I bet you a lot of those Gulf Arab states, which are at the forefront of opposing Iran, will have second thoughts. And they will might very quickly want to decide to actually kind of lessen the tensions with the Iranians. Um, time will show. Um, and how seriously do you take the Saudi claim that um, they would acquire whatever nuclear capability that Iran is um, able to keep? They would seek to acquire that for themselves. I mean, look, on that point, um, the one suspect country that is supposed to be the one that's going to be sort of wrapping up the nuclear weapon and delivering it in Riyadh is it's supposed to be Pakistan. But there's nothing that I see from Pakistan that indicates that they're going to do that. In fact, when the Pakistanis were called to, to go in in Yemen uh, in supporting the uh, Saudi intervention, even on a conventional level, the Pakistanis refused. So um, when you don't have Pakistan, who else do you have? 
to, to sort of get your hands on, on, a, on a nuclear weapon pretty quickly. And from what I understand, they don't have the infrastructure in place, the Saudis, for a good while to be able to do anything indigenously. And on top of all that, the United States is not going to sit still while Saudi Arabia uh, dashes for a nuclear bomb. I mean, just because Iran might get closer to it doesn't mean the U.S. is going to forget about uh, the menace of proliferation across the region. So I think all these factors combined, uh, I understand that the Saudis come in at this emotionally. They're upset. They feel the United States has let Iran get away with it. Uh, but that doesn't mean the Saudis are going to be allowed to do what Iran has essentially done. All right. Well, I think we'll open it up to our audience. Um, if, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, introduce yourself and your affiliation. Um, yeah, sir. Well, depending on where you sit, there are some who say it might help. <laughs> um, <laughs> Secretary Kerry, I believe, will go out to the talks despite his injury um, after the U.S.-China economic dialogue next week. Um, so he won't be totally absent. I think that there is an expectation that, you know, he's going to be there for the crunch time. Um, he, he has uh, developed this really uh, great relationship with Javad Zarif. It was helped by the fact that Javad Zarif was in New York for a number of years beforehand. He spent more, a lot of his life in the United States and, and in fact, is well known to a lot of folks in, in these buildings um, from his time there when he used to host a lot of dinners and even occasionally, once or twice at least, got down here to Washington. Um, the other interesting relationship that's important and that is also to some extent uh, impacted by illness is the relationship that emerged, I'm not sure if you would have seen it in Vienna because it's, I think it's a little bit more recent, um, but between uh, the Secretary of Energy and the head of Iran's atomic energy organization. Um, the, this, the role of Secretary Moniz, I think, was really crucial from everything I've come to understand about the way that the talks played out in the, the final uh, set of uh, discussions in Lausanne. Um, and the fact that he was able to um, have a, a, a very high-level technical discussion with uh, Iran's counterpart, the, the head of the Atomic Energy Organization, who happened to be an MIT grad. Of course, Secretary Moniz was a professor at MIT. That's a slightly different power relationship. Um, but they speak the same language in some respects, and they were able to, I think, have a fairly constructive set of talks. Um, Salehi, the, the head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, also uh, underwent a surgery and has been laid up, and it's not clear if he will be part of the process. Uh, and I think that's actually a, a, a bit of a negative in terms of, of continuing to work out all the, the detailed technical annexes. As I'm sure you know better than anyone else if you were part of this process um, for, for any kind of a final deal. I think that's something that um, all of us who have been covering the talks have been struck by um, compared to, you know, before, right before the Rouhani team came to power, the dynamics between um, uh, the previous negotiator, Jalili, and the, the, the Western negotiators was, were completely, um, it's like a 180 turn um, to now between Zarif and, and uh, Sherman and the others. Um, all right. If, uh, yes, ma'am, in the front. What I was trying to say was this is a country with some serious issues uh, at home. You know, political, lack of political rights, human rights issues in the general sense. And then on top of it, in recent years, you've had ecological issues and other kinds of issues. Sanctions being imposed since 2012. I mean, this is a country with one of the largest brain drains in the world. Four or five million Iranians now live in the diaspora. It didn't happen before. So what I'm trying to say is the list of things that uh, are not going in the right direction in Iran are quite long. And nobody knows that probably better than the Supreme Leader of, of Iran. Again, if I was the Supreme Leader of Iran, been Iran for a quarter of a century, and happened to have taken over in 79 from a man, the Shah, who was supposed to be rock solid, and he disappeared overnight, I would presumably, if I was in his head, think something could go also wrong for me. So I'm, I'm constantly paranoid about where the various risks are coming from 
uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, the mandate he's given to Rouhani about get these sanctions removed, it touches exactly on, on the key concern he has, socioeconomic instability. How is it going to happen? Is it going to be a general sense like Egypt, the sort of Tahrir Square type of thing? Probably not, because Iran as a country is much stronger than anything else you have anywhere in the Middle East. This is an old, ancient country with institutions that are solidly in place. And it, there's also a sense of nationalism, uh, not necessarily supportive of the Islamic Republic, but there is a sense of nationalism that wants to see regime change, but doesn't want to see another 79 revolution that's bloodied and gets hijacked by people that nobody can anticipate before. And again, in 79, most people who came in the streets against the Shah did not want to have a supreme leader. That's, ended up, that, that's exactly what they ended up getting. So I get a sense from Iranians that if they can have, if they can vote for gradual reform over some bloody revolution that nobody can be predict the longer term outcome of, they would go for the graduate reform. So, uh, but then again, you could have sort of a localized, smaller scale cases of implosion. Uh, let me tie it to the region, since I was asked to talk about the region. You got something called Islamic State, 40, 50 kilometers from, from the Iranian border in Diyala province in Iraq. 10% of Iran's population is Sunni. If that kind of sectarian hatred that we see elsewhere starts coming into Iran itself, that's a case of implosion on a lower sort of localized scale. But nonetheless, it's going to be a major headache for, for the Iranian regime that already has had to deal with pollution insurgency down in Southeast in, in the last decade or so and more, Kurdish insurgency um, up in the Northwest. So, there are things that can go wrong, and so quickly, I mean, quicker they can get to a point where they can say, we're going to minimize uh, these various uh, threats that you were facing. I think that quicker they're going to get to go to bed, if I could put it to you that way. Sure. So he's asking, um, are we setting the stage with the deal internally within Iran for raising expectations and then those expectations being dashed? And um, his position is that the 2009 um, uprising was not as widespread and would, would an uprising as a result of, uh, you know, the failure of the talks be more widespread than, than in 2009? Ali Reza, do you want to take that one? Well, I don't think the United States is setting the stage for another green movement uprising. And I don't foresee that happening in the near future, but I wouldn't rule out those sort of disturbances and popular mobilizations in the future because Iran has a history of them. You know, it had a 1905 constitutional revolution, uh, protests and revolts throughout the years, throughout the 20th century, the 1979 revolution, student rights in 1999, the Green Movement uprising in 2009. So I wouldn't rule out mass mobilization in the future, uh, but I think one lesson a lot of Iranians learned from 2009 was to be careful uh, in terms of vigorously and publicly opposing the regime, uh, because really nothing has changed since 2009. 
And I really blame the reformist uh, movement's leadership for actually lack of change in Iran, not just the conservative establishment, but uh, green movement leaders that are actually under house arrest um, because they wanted reforms in Iran and they didn't really specify what they had in mind and why Iranians should risk their lives for when they went out and protested. Uh, so under current circumstances, if there's no vision for the future, is that there's no leadership, why would you go out in the street and risk your life? And I think that's one of the reasons we don't see a lot of public protests in Iran. And Iranians for now are willing to give evolution time. You know, you know they see Rouhani as not necessarily their savior. I don't, I'm not even sure how popular he would be if Iran wasn't. Uh, facing the pressures it is today. But, you know, he's much better than the other candidates he ran against. He seems more reasonable than a lot of the other uh, personalities in Iran, the political leadership. So I think for now they're willing to be patient. If there is a failure in the talks, I don't think that, that they necessarily would go into the streets. But I think, uh, l like Alex said, the regime in Iran has a long-term problem. You know, it hasn't been able to provide economically for the population. Iran is facing environmental disaster. It's facing a severe water shortage right now, it's really severe. Uh, it has some of the most polluted cities on earth, actually. Uh, and in the long term, it's hard to see this sort of a system lasting if it can't address these issues. You know, even the most loyal people, people who still believe in the revolution in Iran and are willing to support Khamenei, I wouldn't be surprised if they have major doubts, even after a nuclear deal happens. And incidentally, the Shah of Iran, the former Shah of Iran, is probably more popular in Iran than he has ever been before. There's this great article in The Guardian, if you get a chance to read it, uh, about how a lot of Iranians look upon the Shah's time with nostalgia. Not that he didn't have his flaws, not that he wasn't a dictator, but uh, because people are so unhappy now, anything that's an alternative to the Islamic Republic seems pretty great. Uh, so that's the basic answer. It's not a yes or no answer, but um, Can I just say go ahead. Um, I, I don't disagree with anything that Ali has said, but I think the most important piece of this is remembering this is. A, not a regime that has been prone to collapse. If you look at the history of the Islamic Republic, they've survived everything short of the plague. Um, yes, things are bad now. Um, things were worse in the 80s. Now, different political circumstances and never say never. I mean, no one predicted the 2009 uprising. Um, and that was, though it was limited in some respects, it was quite serious. But if you look at the reactive power of this regime, they managed to address it in a way that didn't provoke the sort of long-term insurgency problem that you have in, in other parts of the region where similar uprisings were repressed and then uh, prompted uh, violence and, and ultimately civil war. Um, the Iranians also have managed to deal with the sanctions in a way that demonstrates this is, this is a, a system of institutions, not just of personalities and individuals. None of this is meant as praise for the, for, for the government. None of this is meant as, as a, a, any kind of disagreement with what Ali said of, about the failings and the widespread popular dissatisfaction that we believe to be the case based on everything that we can gauge and from episodic uh, direct experience. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it, the danger is in, in any kind of presumption that if uh, you know, Rouhani isn't able to d deliver the goods that suddenly the, the, you're going to see some sort of massive popular uprising. The other piece of the revolution was, you had, the, the 79 revolution was you had a, 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 a system that effectively crumbled. The monarchical system, as, as, as uh, robust as it was, really just collapsed under the face of what had been a very well-organized movement that took place over many months. We just don't have that kind of organization in Iran today, and I don't think you'll see the Islamic Republic collapse as quickly. If I could just follow on, but I totally agree with everything that was said. Um, you know, in 79, they overran the barracks and got their hands on the guns, and that's how the revolution started. Now, we had the Twitter revolution in Iran in 2009, and you can sit in California, wherever it is, tweet away, but unless you're on the ground in Tehran going over 
uh, and physically confronting the regime, then they can always find a way of filtering you out. Um, so, and I think the biggest indictment of the lack of opposition, vision, leadership, and structure is the fact that the biggest political opponent to the system today happens to be the second cousin of the Supreme Leader himself, who happened to be the Prime Minister back in the 1980s, isn't exactly a secular individual if you look at Mir Hossein Mousavi's, um, you know, resume. Uh, and another hard fact is Iranians, unlike the 70s when they brought the Shah down, are busy filling out applications to emigrate in lovely places like Canada. And unless you change that, unless there is a change uh, in that mindset, then it's hard to see where that you know, opposition, critical thinking leadership is going to come from. But as I said earlier, Khamenei knows unless they're going to ha get to a point where they remove the sanctions, maybe that kind of momentum will actually start from within, from the really uh, impoverished, increasingly impoverished uh, groups that you, you, you find um, in Iran. Thank you all. Um, let's go to this side. Uh, right, yes, right here. So the qu yeah. just to sum it up, the question is um, Iran's growing relationship with Russia and what effect it's had on the nuclear negotiations. You know, one way of summing up Iran's attitude towards uh, Russia is, I think it was back in 2006 when uh, uh, Ahmadinejad very, you know, confidently said, don't worry about these sanctions at the UN level. I know from a good source he was referring to the Russians. It's not going to happen. It's going to be, get vetoed. Now, what happened since? The Russians voted against Iran at the UN Security Council four occasions. Russia has never been there for Iran. And the general perception in Iran is Russia uses the Iranian nuclear issue as a way of gaining leverage in its own relationship with the Western world. That is true, I think, by and large. There's a consensus. But again, as I hinted at it in my initial remarks, there are people who still, out of desperation almost, feel like if the, if the United States doesn't meet them halfway, then who else do they have to turn to? And it's Russia. Hassan Rouhani does not belong in that camp. I think the Revolution Guards people and some of the hardliners in the Iranian uh, sort of parliament, if parliament matters, and I'm not of the school of thought that takes the Iranian parliament that seriously, but there are people who think, you know, maybe this time around, because of Crimea, because Putin is what he is, there's a new Cold War, maybe this time around we can actually make a marriage of convenience happen with the Russians that makes sense. I, I'm still doubtful, and I think Rouhani is doubtful. But when Rouhani came in, one of the first things he did back in December 2013 was kind of play the Russian card against themselves, using Russia as a leverage in his otherwise ultimate aim of improving relations with the West. So he signed a barter deal with the, with the Russians, 500,000 uh, know, barrels of oil from Iran going to Russia in, in return for Russian goods and services. That was just a political symbolic moment for the Iranians saying to the West, look, if you don't meet us halfway, then we have alternatives. As we would have probably guessed, that border deal hasn't gone anywhere. And if you listen to Iran's oil minister, Bijan Zangene, he says it doesn't make sense. Uh, so from a practical point of view, there's a lot more cynicism on the Iranian side about what Russia is all about, and Crimea being a factor or not is really not going to change that. Um, and, you know, uh, Putin has met the supreme leader. Uh, but again, except a few occasional announcements of the Russians building another nuclear reactor and all sorts of talk of cooperation, the reality is, as of today, you know, June 2015, the ultimate goal of the Islamic Republic is, is to see if there's a way to turn the page with the United States in particular and Russia, at best, for one uh, faction in Iran, is their, you know, uh, secondary backup option. And coming at it from the energy reporter's perspective, um, there's also the issue of, you know, Russia, Russian-Iranian competition in the field of natural gas, Russia being um, a major exporter, Iran having huge reserves, but currently not really exporting anything significant. And you have to wonder, kind of, how does Russia see, see its interests in terms of allowing Iran access to world energy markets in a big way. Um, all right, next question. Um, I guess this lady in the back.
sure, let me just repeat it. Um, so the question is, uh, are there any positions that the U.S. has had at the beginning that have now changed over the course of the negotiations? And she brought up the example of the possible military dimensions. So the, the possible military dimensions of Iran's program are still part of the negotiations. I think that has been portrayed incorrectly that somehow the United States is conceding on that issue and Iran doesn't have to account for it. Iran does still have to account for it. But I think one thing to remember is the Iranian government is not going to come out and say, guess what, we, we did have a weapons program. We've been telling you we didn't have it. Ha ha. Uh, that's just not going to happen. But Iran in the future has to provide access to its uh, military facilities to ensure that it is not working on weaponizing the program. So I think the hype over this is really overblown, and I have to be very honest with you. I just, you know, Secretary Kerry made one comment, and I think the me you know, certain members of the media have spun it in a way that is not correct. The PMD issue has always been part of the negotiations. Uh, it's just that if we expect Iran to publicly confess, that's not going to happen. The whole point of establishing a verification regime is to make sure Iran can't work on weaponizing the program in the future. We already have a pretty good idea of what it did in the past, and Suzanne talked about this uh, in the beginning, and I'll turn it to her. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything Ali has just said, and I think the broader question of to what extent has the U.S. position moved from where it began, look, this is a negotiation. No side comes into a negotiation and leaves that negotiation in precise, with precisely the same talking points that they began with. But if you look at the components, the requirements for a deal that the United States laid out prior to the initial rounds with the Rouhani team, they're pretty consistent with what has been the U.S. requirement really since the Bush administration's decision in 2006 to establish or the P5 plus one um, by joining what had been a, a solely European negotiating process with Iran on uh, the nuclear program. And that is to ensure that we have objective guarantees that Iran cannot obtain or acquire nuclear weapons capability without the, the international community having sufficient warning and sufficient ability to respond. Um, that was always the goal, and these negotiations really since before we joined them, and it was why the Bush administration initially was not willing to be part of the process that was established by the Europeans after the revelations in 2002. Um, it has always been understood that pressure was being used as a means to an end, and the end was to try to constrain Iran's well-developed nuclear program in a way that would keep them from crossing the nuclear threshold. Had we been able to come to a deal in 2005, prior to the decision in April of that year that was later implemented after the uh, inauguration of Ahmadinejad, to uh, walk away from some of the commitments that had been made voluntarily in, in the negotiations with the Europeans, had we been part of the process then, we would have gotten a much better deal. There's no question about it. We would have had far fewer centrifuges, if any. We wouldn't have had a stockpile of LEU. We wouldn't have had to deal with the Iraq reactor as far along as it is. This is not the best deal that the world can imagine with Iran, but it is, I think, the best deal that we can imagine under the circumstances with which we were presented when we got to a point of real negotiations with Iran on this issue. And it is a deal that will put us in a better position for addressing Iran's nuclear ambitions for the next 10 to 15 years. And even after that point, it's going to give us the keys to the castle. We're going to have the blueprints of the Iranian nuclear industry. We're going to have inspectors all over that country. We're going to have far better knowledge than the international community has ever had about what Iran's been doing, what it's done in the past, and what its future intentions are. And that, to my mind, is a pretty good outcome. I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself as well? So 
So the question is, um, how big of a sticking point is access to Parchin, and um, would the IAEA inspectors be able to uh, access it under the terms of the deal? I'll start, but I'm curious to see what Ali and Alex have to say on this. I mean, look, there's a reason the Iranians have continued to pour concrete all over Parchin. I think we all understand that um, what is there is probably of grave concern, and, and they're going to continue to try to stonewall. I don't quite know how this is going to break out. It is not a function of the additional protocol um, to uh, give access to military bases. What we're trying to negotiate with the Iranians is the additional protocol plus, 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 a much higher standard of inspections and verification, and access to military facilities is part of that. Um, what the precise formula looks like when we come out of it, uh, I, I, I can't say. I think if, if we walk away with a deal that doesn't allow anyone ever to get to Parchin, the administration is going to have a big problem on its hands here and elsewhere. The only thing I say about that is, uh, if you listen to the Iranian rhetoric, what you, we pick up every day in the media, you would think it's never going to happen, because that's the red line. That's the Supreme Leader's red line, and the top Revolutionary Guards every day remind everyone, what's next? They want to come inside our bedrooms and check everything they want. I mean, what's next? Where is it going to end? That's the line that they put out. But if you sort of, you know, quietly listen to the narrative, I've heard the last couple of weeks and months now, which is if there's a justifiable need to inspect a place, then let's talk. But this idea of open-ended, anywhere I want, anytime, they've sort of said, no, that's not going to happen. But if you can justify why you want to see something, but that you know, comes down to the art of diplomacy. How do you go about justifying it? And I'm glad I'm not one of those guys negotiating that one. Well, just no country on earth wants an international body to come and inspect us military sites anytime, anywhere. That's just not going to happen un unless a country has been defeated in war and occupied, and that hasn't happened to Iran. So I think the issue is trying to resolve Iran's sensitivities about its military sites with the need to make sure that they're not being used for weaponization work. And I think there is a middle ground. And I agree with Alex. Uh, you know, the Iranian leadership has opposed a lot of things that have come to pass in the negotiations, and I think will come to pass. It's just figuring out a formula that satisfies both sides. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, yes, there in the back. The question is, uh, if the negotiations fall through, would Iran um, be more driven to China rather than Russia? Um, you know, that obviously happened from the beginning of 2000. And you can go back to the Khatami era. As soon as, uh, you know, uh, Natanz was sort of the first enrichment site, covert Iranian enrichment site came to, um, to light, uh, we see a shift, a gigantic shift in terms of Iranian trade with uh, China. Germany used to be Iran's biggest trading partner. Ch China today trades to the tune of $40 billion, which is about just under. Well, Iran trades for about $110 billion, it used to. I don't know what the latest statistics are. So China has taken over out of necessity because the Europeans basically cut the Iranians uh, off, uh, but also because Ahmadinejad's south and east policy politically sort of encouraged that to the dismay of many Iranians, particularly in the manufacturing sector, who couldn't compete with cheap Chinese goods coming in. So if you're an Iranian shoemaker, suddenly you found yourself not being able to compete with the Chinese. So I think there is a desire on the part of the Rouhani government, certainly, to address the over-reliance on China. Uh, but politically speaking, um, you have, I mean, uh, uh, you're going to mention the energy sector. Um, You've got to deal with, what, with the realities of life. Your biggest customers for your crude are in Asia, South Korea, China, India, and Japan. 
the Europeans used to buy a lot, but they don't. And it just in the energy world, it takes time to shift from one day to another, particularly in the natural gas sector, where you've got to sign you know, 20, 25 year old contracts. So I think for now, even if there's a nuclear deal, even if things with the Europeans and the Americans start improving, for the foreseeable future in terms of five, 10 years, Asia will remain the dominant uh, training partner for the Iranians, but that doesn't mean if the Europe uh, that the Europeans, if they're allowed, they're not going to sort of try and compete with the Asians for that potentially very lucrative market in Iran, a country of 80 million people, pretty wealthy, pretty educated. Um, when I say wealthy, I'm comparing to, to sort of global standards. Um, yeah, look at the statistics. 18 percent of the world's natural gas reserves is in Iran. Almost one-fifth of all the natural gas in the world is in that country. So the idea that you, you know, can ignore it uh, is hard, but you will have to wait for the right conditions to be placed, and it would be a very good start, obviously, to have the sanctions removed in the, in the first instance. Can I just say one quick thing? I mean, the Iranians have some of the same frustrations with the Chinese that they have with the Russians, particularly on economic issues and on energy issues. The Chinese have slow rolled their investments. Um, to effectively adhere to U.S. secondary sanctions uh, in Iran's energy sector. And um, there's a frustration that goes well beyond the, the kind of big project level. There's a sense among uh, Iranian consumers and Iranian political actors that the flood of Chinese goods that has come as the European market has retreated um, has come at the detriment to Iranian manufacturers and domestic industry. And so. You know, I think in some respects the decision to negotiate in a more serious fashion and the, the, the rehabilitation of Rouhani in 2013 was a recognition that Iran simply couldn't rely on, an, on economic relations with Asia, as important as they will be under any future picture. They need to have a, a balanced global portfolio, they need to have access to the international system, and they need to rehabilitate their economic and trade relationships with Europe. Um, so I was just reminded we have the room till two, so we'll keep taking a few more questions. Um, yes, sir. Uh, so the question is in regards to Iran's policies towards um, Hezbollah and the region and uh, this idea that those, those policies are unchanging. Um, Alex or, or Ali Reza, do you want to? Um, you know, I would disagree with, with the idea that nothing has changed. Um, I think clearly, as I again hinted at before, there is a division uh, inside the Islamic Republic about certain issues in, in terms of foreign and regional policy. Uh, and I don't think anyone can deny that. And it's been in place for some time. I mean, if you go and read the, the sort of statements that someone like uh, former President Hashemi Rafsanjani makes about what Iran ought to be, I mean, this just doesn't tally up with what the Supreme Leader oftentimes says. So you have very different worldviews, and that you can't deny.